it got uh, gets a connection of electromagnetic somehow. So we'll see what happens with that. So the first speaker is Francesco Panarale. Okay. Um, there. And I guess we've got 30 plus 15 thereabouts, right? Okay. okay. That's fine. All right. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll be telling you about neutron star black hole binaries a little bit. Starting off with recent results on gravitational wave emission from these binaries and why we decided to look at joint detections with electromagnetic counterparts to try essentially to constrain, to think of a new way to constrain the equation of state with neutron star black hole binaries. And yeah, I should mention the results I'll present after the introduction were obtained with the collaboration of Frank Holme, who's another uh, postdoc at Cardiff University. So um, numerical relativity simulations of uh, neutron star black hole binaries have shown us that we can classify these mergers in three different categories. In the first one, the neutron star approaches the black hole it reaches the ISCO, so the innermost stable circular orbit, before it reaches its tidal disruption uh, orbit. So it essentially plunges as a whole onto the, onto the black hole. It's swallowed without uh, shattering any matter around the black hole. On the other end, we see that the neutron star uh, reaches a tidal disruption radius. It's um, elongated. It will be disrupted. and the part of its matter will accrete onto the black hole incoherently and another, uh, the remaining matter may form an accretion disk around the black hole. And then of course there's an intermediate region where the tidal disruption radius and the neutrons and the innermost stable circular orbit are very close to each other. Well, the, t the two radii or the two orbits are close. I, sh I shouldn't mix the two words. So the neutron star may be uh, deformed and disrupted, but um, no matter survives the disruption and everything is promptly accreted. So in, in terms of the gravitational wave emission, if we look at the first scenario, and this is frequency versus the, the amplitude of the gravitational wave form uh, in the frequency domain, um, an emission from this system would look very much like a uh, black hole, black hole emission. So this is the spiral phase. And this is the excitation of the, of the um, quasi-normal mode ring down of the final, of the remnant black hole. On the other end, in this case, during the spiral, the star is disrupted. Uh, the accretion of the material is incoherent. The amplitude of the gravitational wave um, diminishes. And the system does not manage to excite the quasi-normal mode ring down. So we don't have this hump anymore. And then, of course, there's an intermediate region. Um, there's this intermediate uh, region between the two extreme cases. There is a flattening. We don't really see this uh, hump of the quasi-normal mode ring down, but something, it, it, it's hidden in here. It's not as excited as strongly, but it is in here. And all I've been doing with these three curves at a fixed um, mass ratio spin and neutron star mass is to vary the equation of state of the neutron star. So uh, people have thought of two things. Uh, you may have heard about looking at tidal deformations during the in spiral, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit. But also people have thought of constraining the equation of state uh, at, at high frequency, because obviously the shot of frequency of these three um, spectra is very different um, and is connected to, to the equation of state of the neutron star. So regarding the in-spiral, yeah. So how are these actually observable differences? In yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. Yeah. So um, regarding the in-spiral, uh, some work we did a few years ago was to compare black hole black hole waveforms to black hole neutron star waveforms, in which all we did was to substitute the low mass black hole with a neutron star, we varied its equation of state. We only considered the in spiral phase. Uh, we had tidal terms in there. And we calculated differences between waveforms. And what we saw is that no matter how uh, much we pushed uh, the, the stiffness of the neutron star equation of state, and we spun up the black hole and everything you want to try to, 
to enhance the tidal um, deformation effects, the two waveforms for a given system would overlap very, very well. And differences would be of the or sub, sub percent, essentially. So this, in terms of detections, translates into the fact that if we use black hole, black hole template banks, we would miss less than 1% of neutron star black hole signal. <coughs> so it's a good um, result in terms of detecting neutron star black hole in spirals. It's a bad result. And it's an unfortunate, unfortunate result in terms of trying to use the in-spiral phase to, to constrain the equation of state. And then people have looked at... Uh, okay. So uh, can yeah. I just ask, when you say the in-spiral phase, how do you define that? Where, where do you... For non-disrupting non non systems, we truncate at the ISCO. For ones that are disruptive, we were cutting everything at 500 hertz. Um, no, hold on. No, we did two things. Sorry, no. We cut at, at uh, the tidal disruption radius of the star, which is obtained from an equation to be solved in curved space time. And then we sent the paper around, and we were told, well, try varying this as much as you can. We even, you know, multiply, well, and, and tried to enhance the effect by assuming that the tidal disruption radius was underestimated. Things wouldn't change. People were using these 500 hertz with binary neutron stars. We, ch we tried that too. That mm, overlap is, was pretty robust. So for high frequency, well, what were you taking for your NS VH waveforms? We were taking uh, Taylor T2, Taylor F2, sorry, with tidal terms. So the amplitude was not changed. Tidal terms of relative 1pn order in the phase contribution. How accurately will the mass ratio? Sorry, how? Oh? For the black hole, black hole mergers, how accurately can mass ratios be determined? Not very accurately. No. Constraining the mass ratio is, is, let's say, virtually impossible. I mean, it's not an easy quantity to, to, to be extracted from a, from a detection. Yes, at least several percent. We'll see later on in the talk that there is a degeneracy between the spins and the mass ratio, so you can't really disentangle these two. So at, at high frequencies, merger and ring down or whatever, the shutoff frequency of, of the waveforms, uh, it was shown in this paper that you can still um, extract at high frequency the tidal deformability parameter of the neutron star, which is connected to its mass, its uh, radius, and to its love number, it's the L2, L equal to deformability. And so this, again, s seems to be good news because it factors out nicely, uh, uh, let's say, in your detection. And then in this other paper, the same authors went beyond this study, and they combined the small um, tidal dependent effects from the inspiral with uh, high frequency effects. And they saw that they could improve the, 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 the accuracy over the measured lambda, lambda by a factor three. But then if they started incorporating correlations in their, in their uh, analysis and their waveform parameters from both sides, everything scaled again by a factor three. So essentially, they ended up being here again. So in some sense, the final message is, unless you're very, very lucky, it's hard with gravitational waves alone and mixed binaries to extract uh, information connected to, to the equation of state. However, we know that. But, sorry, uh, yes. But, but those studies are based on looking at a single source at any given time, right? Uh, to contrast it with uh, the study of uh, Del Pozo that Satya mentioned on the first day of this conference, which considered at least 25 or more sources, where maybe it will be able to discern the value of lambda somewhat, at least for extreme equations. Yeah, but you still have, yes, in that sense you have to be lucky. You need uh, a good, a lucky alignment. You need stiff equations of state to enhance your effects. But let's say on, on average you have errors on lambda that vary from 50% to 100%. It's, and this doesn't really pick, not even a subset of equation of state. I mean. Right. All right, so we know, however, that there are disruptive black hole neutron star mergers. The 
gravitational waves um, shrink the, 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 the radius of the orbit, and then the matter may be shattered around, form a torus, it can have unbound tails and arc processes and all that, crust failure perhaps. Anyways, there are, th th the other way we have to look at mixed binaries is to, is to think that these systems can also be electromagnetic uh, sources, and there is specifically uh, a wild belief that they can be SGRB sources. So now instead of looking at them only with the eyes of, of detectors like LIGO, we can even think of, of electromagnetic detectors such as SWIFT or, or, or other ones. So the questions we asked were three, essentially. The first one is, if we have a gravitational wave observation of a neutron star black hole system, can we say upon detection, can we estimate somehow our chances of, of, expect, of having an electromagnetic counterpart? And then we can reverse the problem and say, okay, say the, the system evolved, it had, it, um, evolved into an SGRB in a short gamma ray burst, so we have a trigger from our EM friends. How can we improve an offline search of gravitational waves for, for following that trigger for black hole neutron star systems? And then the final question is, if we, detect, if we can associate two, de two detections, a, a GW and an EM observation, can we use the, these joint detections, to, these joint observations to constrain the equation of state of the neutron star? So I'll be focusing on InSpiral only because, as I said at the beginning, uh, these systems behave essentially like black hole, black hole systems, so we can consider the InSpiral only and make conservative uh, statements in our GW uh, analysis. The difficulty with gravitational waves is that if you have a, a detection, you cannot determine all <coughs> parameters of the source uh, with high accuracy. In particular, there is this degeneracy between spin, spin, between spin and mass ratio I was talking about. So in blue, uh, this is the time domain waveform of a system with 1.35 solar masses and 5 solar masses. The primary component has a um, dimensionless spin parameter of 0 0.3, and the waveform is, is the blue one that's plotted here. If we keep the chirp mass constant and we vary the, the mass ratio, so we go to a more equal mass ratio situation, and at the same time we lower the spin parameter, the waveform essentially doesn't, doesn't change. So there are degeneracies in the space, in the, um, space of waveforms, and understanding how these how to move in the, in the parameter space to, 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 ca to exploit these degeneracies is very important because it can improve our search strategies and it can help us interpret correctly our future detections and observations of, of um, binary mergers. So well, the that plot shows over 150 milliseconds. Yes. We know how the phasing might be over a couple of minutes, which is what we will observe these systems for. These are essentially undistinguishable. This is a, de a degeneracy. Yes. Is this spin uh, aligned with yeah. the, or is with that, is it, how much misalignment do you need before that So again, conservatively, and this is, I'll get to this later, um, you cannot, upon detection, without doing parameter estimation and more, uh, say, complicated, lengthy calculations, if you have a misalignment angle, you can not distinguish. Uh, as long as you keep, sorry, a misalignment angle and you keep the projection of the spin constant over on the projection on the orbital angular momentum, you cannot distinguish two systems from the gravitational wave emission. Okay, so the way to look at, one way to look at, um, the generacies is to use principal component uh, analysis, and this is a way of, of calculating disagreements between two waveforms that is very accurate and is very cheap in terms of computational costs. And what you're doing is you rewrite differences uh, between two gravitational waveforms. You write these up as a matrix, so you diagonalize the matrix, and you have principal directions of, of degeneracies in, in the space of, of waveforms, and these are represented by these mu vectors. And let's say the precision to which we can 
um, measure this uh, principal component is given by the uh, eigenvalue. So these eigenvalues will rank all your degeneracies in the space of, of, of waveforms. So the first well-known degeneracy is the chirp mass. So if you, as long as you keep this number constant, um, your waveform in some sense doesn't change. You can't really, uh, which is what I did here, distinguish two systems with the same chirp mass. So it's the first quantity you extract uh, from a gravitational wave detection. And this is extremely well uh, measurable, sub percent again. And then we have this uh, mass ratio spin degeneracy, the second principal component. This is something you can constrain pretty well, but you cannot say, you know, you cannot give a, a, a num definite number for one uh, con um, quantity and the other. You can give it for, for the, this, the, the degeneracy parameter. And this constrains the other two quantities. Then you have higher uh, component, higher order principal, sorry, yeah, higher order principal directions in your waveform space. These are harder to constrain. They do give you some information, but uh, we, we neglect them here. We just focus on the, one, on the two that we can constrain pretty well. So all in all, um, given that you can, const you can constrain a mass, but you have this degeneracy, in a 3D parameter space where your 3D parameters are the black hole mass, the neutron star mass, and the, and the spinner of the black hole, you, you, a gravitational wave measurement picks up a 1D line in this 3D space because of this degeneracy. And this is what it looks like. Um, this is the black hole mass, uh, neutron star mass space. We fix uh, family of targets with 1.35 uh, of systems with 1.35 solar mass neutron stars and essentially if you pick a point say here this is one of your sources it emits a gravitational wave you detect it and you cannot distinguish it from any other system that lives along this line and what is changing here the, the <coughs> chirp mass is constant what we're changing is that it's hidden in the spot is the is the um, spin of the black hole, all right? <coughs> now, if you pick one of these lines, one of the chirp masses, so constant chirp mass, and you look at things in the black hole mass, uh, black hole spin uh, plane, these are the spin um, mass ratio degeneracies. So again, if you pick, say, this source, which is your typical mm, 10 solar mass, 1.35 solar mass system, uh, it, uh, the um, if the source has, say, a spin of 0 0.5, you <coughs> cannot distinguish it from any other of these sources. Okay? So this is really the 1D line that you pick up in this 3D parameter space. Now, there is another degeneracy related to what uh, Brian just uh, asked a few minutes ago. And a conservative statement is that as long as we keep the projection of the black hole spin, on the orbital angular momentum constant, we cannot distinguish the, the two systems with different tilts by their gravitational wave emission. So um, a, black, a black hole spin aligns to the orbital angular momentum with this magnitude of spin emits a gravitational wave. We cannot immediately say if it was aligned really or if it was maximally tilted or somewhere in between. So I'll assume that we don't know anything about the um, about the tilt of the spin. Now, in terms of electromagnetic counterparts, the situation is, is messier. It's before, before we yep. get into electromagnetic, so if I wanted to make the statement that a system is a neutron star black hole merger versus neutron star neutron star versus black hole black hole, is there a way to it's, make that statement? It's, uh, not it's not necessarily easy. Either you really pick up uh, I don't know, okay, this is extreme, but if I pick up this principal component, it's easier to believe that you know, the, the low mass uh, object is a neutron star rather than a black hole. But really, what can you uniquely pinpoint the fact that we've seen a black hole neutron star system is an EM counterpart. So this is already, a, let's say, a zero order statement of what you can do with joint detections. If you see a joint detection, if you have a joint detection, and you, wait, 
If you look at the gravitation wave only, and you cannot conclude if it's a mixed binary or black hole, black hole binary, and a joint EM detection can, can, tell, can disentangle yeah. this. I think what, what happens is you can set upper limits and lower limits on masses. And if you're ready to say, hey, this has to be a neutron star because it's less than 2.5 or 1.3 or whatever your favorite upper limit on neutron star masses, that's the only way it looks like you can tell. So if the chirp mass were big enough, yeah. then you'd say it had to be a neutron uh, black hole. Yeah. That's a, no, it's not easy. No, yeah. that's right. No. So we, we, we are not sensitive to what happens at very high frequencies. Yeah. Until we have detectors that can do that, th this is all that will be possible. All yeah. these statements are mostly about yeah. advanced LIGO probably. Yes, exactly. Yeah. If you had so third generation detectors and you could really pick up the shot of frequency, then you can say something without the, the um, EM counterpart. Now, let's say, let's say that we have this more advanced uh, detector eventually, um, and you can break some of that degeneracy. Can you tell that an object is a neutron star? Let's say you, you know that the mass of one of the objects is 2.5 solar masses. Can you tell if it's a neutron star or a black hole? This is by looking at the, this tidal disruption frequency or whatever. Uh, if it's disrupted, it's yes. Work. We still don't know how well we can say. If it occurs at 100 megaparsec in Einstein telescope, we probably can. Mm -hmm. But if it occurs at 500 megaparsec, we don't, we don't know. So that, that's kind of. But we had these discussions about you know post merger dynamics of the hypermassive neutron star producing the left modes. So that should be that was That was 10 megaparsec. But that's also yeah. neutron star, yeah. neutron star. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, but we're still working on grading models and, and really making our uh, assessments more final. So I had a question. So in this case, if the uh, spin of the black hole is larger but it's still big, is it not possible that it, uh, it from the uh, ISCO radius, we infer whether uh, this is the case in the case in the sense that the inspiral will last longer if you have uh, you know black holes. So, so if you if you said if if what's yeah. bigger though the the projection or the whole of the magnitude of the tilted spin? The projection itself. Yes, if if you if you increase the projection, yes, the the orbital angular. Sorry, the Radius of the ISCO does shrink, yes. But you can't, that's yeah. degenerate with other parameters, and therefore it's difficult to. But it's all mixed in the end, in, in your amplitude. It, it, the, the signal doesn't drop off at the ISCO if you don't have disruption. It drop, drops off at the quasi normal mode frequency of the black hole remnant, which does depend on those parameters of the initial system, too, if you want. But I mean, again, this is all high frequency, very complicated data analysis. Okay, back to EM counterparts. Um, with numerical relativity simulations, you can simulate black hole neutron star system mergers. You can get uh, distributions of, I don't know, angular momentum, configurations of magnetic fields. You can add neutrino cooling, all sorts of things. Temperature distributions. But uh, again, at the, at the bottom of the, um, at the, at the end of the line, if you don't have a disruption and uh, there is no um, disk forming around the black hole remnant, so you, if you have no matter, you cannot have any EM counterparts unless, of course, you have uh, the, the, these intermediate cases where the, you have a precursor because the neutron star is disrupted, but everything is accreted. But I mean, this is this is a very thin line, so. Again, w we, w we have made uh, the conservative assumption of using the disk mass uh, of, of, of the remnants as a proxy for EM emission. So roughly speaking, if you have uh, a remnant that's below a percent of the solar mass, we're saying that you don't have uh, an EM counterpart. If it's above, you do. This is the, ch the choice of the number is connected to, uh, let's say, S SGRB. Um, progenitor studies. So there are simulations that give you the, the, the accretion rate. You assume that this is accreting for um, 
uh, I don't know, one or two seconds. So if, to have enough energy to power the SGRB, what you need is uh, a disk mass remnant that's roughly between 0.02 and 0.05 solar masses. OK. So oh, yeah, I have the slide. Instead of saying this in words, I could have shown it. In other <laughs> words, if the disk mass remnant, the, the remnant of the Sorry, the, di the remnant disk mass is bigger than the threshold of the order of a percent of the solar mass. We do have an EM counterpart. In particular, we're thinking of SGRB ignition. Otherwise, we, we don't, the, the system is EM silent. And the way to, given the initial parameters of the system, the way to predict the, the disk mass is to use this uh, fit that Francois Foucault came up with in 2012. And what he did is he took all the available numerical relativity results back then and uh, fitted them with a, a, a good guess of, of the dependency of the disk mass on the, quant on the relevant quantities. There are, in particular, three um, lengths, the tidal disruption radius, the ISCO radius, and the neutron star radius. And uh, what's, what this is telling you is that the more neutron stars you can fit for a system between the tidal disruption radius and the, and the ISCO, sorry, the tidal disruption orbit and the ISCO, the, the bigger that your disk mass will be. And of course, everything scales with the available matter you have to start with in, in the neutron star. And I guess I should say the B everywhere starts, stands for uh, baryonic matter, uh, channeling rest mass. Uh, I don't need this massive of a disk. I'll, I have a spin of the black hole. All I need is a, is a massive enough disk to anchor a magnetic field to extract uh, you know, 10 to the 49 or to 10 to the 50 Hertz energy release for, for gamma rays. So I, I think this hundredth of a solar mass, I, I think you could theoretically go to much lower in principle. Yes. That's if true. you really want to be super conservative, I mean, you don't need a very much. Because you're, you're not, it's not like you're necessarily extracting the creation energy of the disk. You could extract the spin of the yeah. black hole. Yeah, and also, I mean, the, the simplifying assumption is also that there's one value for this threshold mass, which isn't necessarily true for every system. So well, this, I guess I'm, I'm curious how if you were to lower this to almost zero mass, would this change, this would change things? This like does zero. not change. I mean, the global picture doesn't change. The, if you see an EM counterpart or not, you can still make, uh, statements about the equation of state, whether it's very stiff or very soft. It, w it does blur your lines around, your thresholds around. And then uh, later on when I uh, talk about what if we're following up an SGRB trigger, we were very conservative. So we assume that everything with um, M disk zero is, is quiet, but everything with a non-zero disk mass is potentially an EM loud source. They observe or the, uh, the accretion yeah, rate, they, okay. Yeah. <coughs> right, right, but I, I think I don't, maybe I don't trust the simulation. So yeah. yeah. So, so since you're channeling Enrico, and I've always wanted to ask him this question. So <laughs> 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 the derivation he has for, the, for this is simply, he just, he looks at the, the to, to get the magnetic field, he just looks at the mass density and says, you know, gets the energy density of the, material and says what kind of magnetic field can I get and what kind of magnetic field does he then need to tap into the spin energy? Does it need a strong magnetic field? I think it has to be strong, but I think even a small, I don't remember exactly what, it, what he's doing. Somehow he's equating kind of the, um, you know, the pressure of the disk to the, the B so squared over yeah, so the, of the, of the, of the, the energy field. density of the disk to the, to the uh, magnetic field that he's using. Yeah, yeah so it's very, a lot of loopholes, but I think you do. You still need a very strong magnetic field. I think he's just saying, given <coughs> that such a field could be generated. Okay. okay. So, uh, the thing, the other thing I should say is that this uh, fit was was um, performed on a relati numerical relativity results for simulations with aligned black hole <laughs> spin and orbital angular momentum. And then this was generalized later on, well, one year later, by uh, Ido Berger and his collaborators. 
and it works pretty well even for, for s systems with tilted black hole spin. So these are the, the calculations we performed. We picked uh, classes of target systems. Um, in particular, we fixed the, the, the um, magnitude of the black hole spin to 0 0.998 in order to maximize our chances <coughs> of having a massive uh, remnant disk. Um, and the two classes of target systems we picked had either constant chirp mass, which is something, again, we can determine very accurately with a gravitational wave detect measurement, uh, or they, had, they were um, degenerate with systems that had a fixed, solar, a, a fixed neutron star at mass and a fixed uh, black hole spin projection on the angular momentum. Then we performed our principal component analysis. For details, we used advanced LIGO in zero detuned high power mode, a, a, frequency of, of, um, a lower frequency of, of 15 hertz. And we cut off our waveforms at the, at the ISCO. And we're using Taylor T2 um, point mass, point mass um, in spirals. So once we have our, our slice or whatever in, in, in the, um, along these degeneracies, we pick an equation of state. And along all the degeneracies, we calculate the disk mass. Yeah, there you go, for each point. And then we can uh, split the space into regions where we expect a counterpart, so the disk mass exceeds a threshold or uh, uh, areas, again, given an equation of state that are not EM loud and we, where we do not expect to have an EM counterpart of any sort. And then we overlay our GW results and our, our splitting of the space into EM loud and EM quiet regions and we see what happens. So again, this, these were the two pictures, the two ways of looking at these uh, degeneracies in the gravitational wave form parameter space. Now, if we, so this means that at each point here, I have three values, the black hole mass, the neutron star mass, and a, and a black hole spin that is compatible with points along this um, class of, of, of target sources. And the same is true here. Here, however, the chirp mass is fixed, so you can see your three parameters directly, because the two masses are connected by the, the value of the chirp mass. And then we color in, we fix an equation of state and we color in these, these slices. So if we pick an equation of state that gives you very large neutron star radii, you have uh, areas that are EM silent and areas that are EM loud. And of course, if you shrink suddenly the, the, all the neutron star radii by um, picking a very soft equation of state, what you have is that this region is EM loud uh, for, for both, for both uh, equations of state, so the white, this region is EM loud only if you have the PS equation of state, so a large neutron star ADI, and the dark gray regions are EM silent for both equations of state. So realistically, there you go, uh, um, your, your threshold between, well, your, yeah, your border between EM loud systems and EM quiet systems will be somewhere in between this gray band. So I'm showing APR2 in some sense as your standard uh, guess of what the behavior should be. Are now, these finite temperature simulations? These are, wait, 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 wait. These, these are not simulations. The, 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 these equations of state are all cold equations of, of state. The simulations on which the fit was, 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 was built started off with data that had cold equation of state, but then it, uh, the temperature could evolve in, during the simulation, so even in the remnant. Just taking the tidal structure and radius from the equation of state, and then... Yes. And then just... Yeah. So that's why it's just the contour along yeah. the given ice scale. Does, does that ans answer your question about the... I don't know which simulations you were referring to. I mean, in principle, the amount of ejected matter would depend on the... Yes. Temperature dependence of the So I think that this mass does not uh, depend significantly on the uh, effect of the temperature. But all your initial data is, is cold mm -hmm. in, in these simulations. Then you have thermal effects. But it, they're not it, let's say they're not factored in the initial data at all. 
Uh, oh, yes. Um, so the fit was built on um, nuclear equations state, let's say, non-exotic results. Uh, the, fit, the, res the numerical relativity simulations on which the fit was built upon uh, had uh, ordinary matter, let's say. So we, we can take an extrapolation, but uh, with, with a grain of salt, and we can calculate the boundary between uh, EM loud binaries and EM quiet um, binaries for strange quark matter, just to, to know where it, where it would live in, in, in this uh, parameter space. But again, this is a very, uh, let's say, dangerous extrapolation of the fit. So uh, we'll be careful about stain statements and strange quark matter. So now I overlay the, the, the gravitational wave degeneracies in red. And, and OK, we, we've seen clearly that you have regions in which EM follow-ups are favorable. So if I were to detect something here or that corresponds to something down here, I would advocate performing an EM follow-up. If I would pick up a system that lives in these dark regions and I uh, would want to save uh, money that goes in EM experiments, I would say, okay, don't follow up uh, this gravitational wave trigger. Now, the other thing that we can say is if we increase the, the, the black hole spin of the target, so here it's 0 0.33, we increase it to 0 0.66, the um, chances of having an EM counterpart uh, increase. So the, the white region where um, EM counterparts are supported for any equation of state increases in area. The same is true for, for, for the light gray region. And you can obtain the same effect. We go back to, this is the previous slide, by lowering the, the, the chirp mass. So again, now I'll change the chirp mass. And again, your, your white region, gray region, increase in area. And your EM um, quiet uh, portion of space times shrinks in volume, really, it's not area. But. Okay, so another important point is that these the, the, the gravitational wave degeneracy lines do not cut through this way, so they hardly intersect with the with the uh, <coughs> equation of state dependent thresholds, and and this is important because it means that we could conceivably try to constrain uh, the neutron star equation of state with with joint detections. So um, especially if we have, no, specifically if we have a, a joint uh, EM and GW detection, what we can say is uh, we, we can place a lower bound on the equation of state system. So if we were to, um, for example, pick up this line with a gravitational wave measurement, we can say that anything, any equation of state that supports uh, a, um, a counterpart all along this line is still valid. All the other equations of state that would not support any counterpart along this line can be excluded. Okay. Certainly with errors and other things to refine, but this is roughly the idea. When you say EM loud, is that beamed? Possibly, yes. So you have to be, uh, in terms of SGRBs, you have to be Again, lucky. The beam has to come towards you, and you have to be able to detect the gravitational wave. So there are no beaming calculations in this. We're just saying if we have a joint detection, particularly, particularly SGRBs, we can draw conclusions on the neutron star equation of state. Does the gravitational wave signal contain any information on the orbital plane? Yes, but it's, again, uh, harder. It, it's it's a um, more complicated analysis to do, a lengthier one. So what you can think of doing, we've been conservative and assumed we don't know anything about beams and orbital planes and tilts. What you can do if you have a joint detection, you make uh, a first statement with these techniques, and then you refine your analysis along the, 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 de the degeneracy lines and consider more parameters with parameter estimation techniques. So um, in, in particular, if we, if we look at systems with low black hole spin, we can immediately exclude, and we have a joint detection, sorry, we can immediately exclude soft equations of state. Um, so this means that if we do detect a counterpart somewhere down here, and, 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 um, 
uh, a gravitational wave signal and its electromagnetic counterpart, none of the equations of state that are soft and support um, counterparts only up here can be valid. In particular, if we trust for a while this extrapolation to strange quark matter, even detecting, uh, making a joint detection down here would exclude immediately the, the possibility that that um, progenitor ha had a neutron star, or a strange star in it. Okay, so this plot summarizes things a little. So we look at uh, relevant quantities in GW terms, so the chirp mass and the projection of the black hole spin on the orbital angular momentum. We can split the, the, the parameter space in three areas one in which, which will, should necessarily be EM uh, quiet, one that is EM loud, and this whole gray region where we can perform con constraints on the equation of state. And again, to, to guide your eye, uh, APR2 has a, a boundary down here. So APR2 is EM silent up to here and EM loud from here onwards. Now say we detect a gravitational wave. <coughs> We will constrain its chirp mass. We will, sorry, we will measure its chirp mass. We will constrain the value of the black hole spin in the progenitor. And in this example, a joint detection happening here is compatible with the, with the APR2 equation of state. If we were to detect something like this, we have a marginal. Sorry, this is supported. This is compatible. And this kind of measurement would exclude APR2 as a, as a valid equation of state. And finally, there was a question about there was a question in one of the first slides about um, what if we follow up an SGRB trigger with an offline gravitational wave that, um, search for a neutron star black hole in spirals. So in a situation like that, we would roughly be um, performing a search over this parameter space. So this is the interval in which we'd vary the neutron star mass, the black hole mass, and the black hole uh, spin. And searches would be performed with uh, templates that have aligned black hole spin and uh, orbital angular momentum. And these would even pick up the tilted systems. So conservatively, we can uh, calculate the size, the portion of parameter space where an SGRB cannot be ignited. And we do this by maximizing the black hole spin, its, its, uh, um, its magnitude. We, we, fix, we, we pick one of these piecewise polytropic equation of state that give you very large uh, neutron star radii, which enhances your chance of producing a disk mass and therefore having an SGRB counterpart. And also this piecewise polytrope has a maximum mass that is very high, so it covers this, this full range. And then we make, again, the conservative, the, c the calculation is conservative in, also in the sense that we say that no SGRB is produced only if the, the disk mass is exactly zero. And at the end of the day, we find that 35% uh, of the parameter space is uh, useful when following up the short gamma ray burst trigger. If we were to align exactly the, the black hole spin to the orbital angular momentum, this portion of parameter space shrinks to 25%. Now, if we cover this parameter space with template banks used for searches, these two numbers translate into 43% of the templates being in an SGRB quiet region or for a line system, 48% of them. So roughly we could cut off uh, computational costs in, by a factor two in following up an SGRB for, uh, with an offline search of mixed binaries. And this means that we would increase the speed, of course, but it also means that we would increase the sensitivity of the search. Because ev any time you look for systems um, that are not compatible with your source, you're in some sense polluting your search and uh, lowering your, your fa false alarm rates. Sorry, uh, increasing your false alarm rates. So cleaning up your, your template bank increases speed and sensitivity. So again, at the end of the day, we've seen how we can split the, the, the parameter space in three regions. Um, this is something that intuitively had been understood already with analytical calculations and simulations. 
But what we've really done is that we've translated this conventional wisdom that was in the community into quantitative predictions for compact binary coalescence searches. And this hadn't been done yet. We've seen how joint detection can potentially place uh, lower bounds on the equation of state stiffness. And we've developed this whole framework uh, to assess the importance of a follow-up to a gravitational wave detect uh, detection. And what we'd like to do now is to add this onto existing pipeline and, and sorry, search pipelines and parameter estimation pipelines. There's interest in doing this. We should just sit down and do it once and for all. And again, the benefit we would have in following short gamma ray burst triggers is that we could uh, speed up all our offline searches for mixed binaries and increase their, their sensitivity. And that's what I had to tell you for today. If I may play as the devil's advocate on the previous slide, do you think this one? Yeah. Yeah, this message will be uh, anybody will take heed to this message, uh, especially for offline searches. Computational resources are speed and not issues. They have already paid attention to it. Um, so, um, meaning, uh, why do we have to turn things around that fast? I mean, in any case, uh, it, it will be a most of weeks latency. By it's it's weeks. mainly for sensitivity. But even sensitivity wise, I mean, these are pretty long waveforms. I can understand the increase in false alarm rate for relatively sh short duration waveforms, so for our black hole, black hole searches, but the waveforms are small. And we are affected by glitches of that time scale. But for these, you know, minutes long waveforms, do you really think false alarm will increase if we do that constraining by, you know, 50% uh, of the temperature? time? Yeah. By how much they, the, the increase, well, the, yeah, the sensitivity increases. Quantifying it, we haven't done it yet. We've quantified the speed up, if you wish. But, I mean, we've presented this on, on data analysis group talks, and people really want us to sit down and implement this properly. I think it's not the sensitivity that will improve. I think it's the significance, in the sense that we know that if we can find a counterpart that immediately improves significance, we can probably bring down the signal to noise ratio. In that case, yes. sensitivity will improve, but we know significance so quickly goes down. But one unit of signal to noise ratio, our background increases by a two orders of magnitude, unfortunately. So to bring down the to bring up the sensitivity, bring down the bring roll. down the pressure, it's, it's going to be hard. On the other hand, I think significance it may be possible to improve. Quantifying these things is what we should be doing over the next yeah. few months to year. For, I mean. for now, and then we save the rest for the discussion. If you see an electromagnetic counterpart in the black region that you claim is forbidden, that would be um, what gives. Very interesting. He's five. <laughs> <laughs> right? This is no. I <laughs> like to understand what is the false rate if we point a telescope at a random fourth position in the sky. Uh, uh, the, no, these are not question. The question no, was, no, no, you see no. something that is okay. really an EM counterpart. What is it? What, what was the? I mean, the question is if it's really an EM counterpart, not if you, if you yeah. 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 Let's say that you said this is definitely an EM counterpart. So you associate the two? Well, you that's related to the false, not false, what is it? How frequently transients occur in the sky, right? Yeah, but let's say that I solved that problem. I, I told you it's definitely the counterpart. Well, what if you vary your threshold, your mass threshold for having EM? Yeah, well, these, so will that, uh, they move around, but uh, they won't go down here. To negative values yeah, to, get, to get to down here. Yeah, point. So is it down in the black region? Yeah, 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 down here. Yeah. 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 In the black region. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay. I mean, we can say th three things, I guess. Well, I don't know, at least two. One is I'm fired. The, the other yeah, one is, absolutely. the other one is, you know, the, the, well, but this goes against what you said. The, well, you could say another thing. Neutron star radii are huge. And the third thing is it really wasn't a correct uh, association of the two signals. These, these are the three. Um, unfortunately, the, the first one is the most likely. Sorry. <laughs> if it is the lower part, it could be a binary neutron star. If you it's don't know here, though, yeah, a low chip mass is here. No. Okay. One point two two. <coughs> I mean, it's not. It, it, it's 
question. Yeah. So can I can I suggest we uh, cut it at this point? We have a discussion later, but we have another talk first. So I'd rather get that talk done and then a break, and then we can have a discussion. So it's good that there's a discussion. I stimulate you all to hold on to that thought. <laughs> And don't get distracted by the next speaker. <laughs> well, I want to focus on that for now. That's the wrong, that's the wrong signal. <laughs>